Welcome to the Women's Law Projects webinar on Title IX rights for pregnant and parenting students. My name is Sujaya Rajguru, and I am a staff attorney at the Women's Law Project. At the Women's Law Project, we support and advocate for students and advocates working toward completing their education while pregnant or parenting in Pennsylvania. If you're pregnant or thinking about becoming pregnant, or if you're parenting, you may have questions about your rights at school. This webinar will provide information about legal protections available to pregnant and parenting students. Thank you to the Dolfinger McMahon Foundation for making this webinar possible. This webinar is for informational purposes only and does not constitute legal advice. If you have a specific question or need legal advice, contact the Women's Law Project for assistance at info at womenslawproject.org. One common problem facing pregnant and parenting students in schools is denying childbirth accommodations like remote learning and leave. This makes it hard for a student to stay on track for graduation because they need time to recover from childbirth and bond with their baby before returning to school. Another common problem is being denied reasonable opportunities to make up missed work. This can result in missed deadlines and lower grades. Another issue is adverse treatment, including discipline or forced leave. This negative treatment from a school can be costly and delay graduation. A lack of access to lactation accommodations or retaliation or punitive measures imposed for trying to exercise one's right to access these accommodations is another common problem. Students in certain programs face unique challenges. Pregnant college and graduate students in the science, tech, and clinical fields face unique obstacles based on field requirements and the school environment. Undergraduates at community colleges also face particular challenges because they tend to begin their degree program at an older age. Title IX is a law that prohibits sex discrimination in any federal program that receives federal financial assistance. It states, no person in the United States shall, on the basis of sex, be subjected to discrimination under any education program or activity receiving federal financial assistance. Title IX means that covered schools cannot discriminate or exercise unfair treatment based on the sex of a student. The law applies from elementary school to the university level and beyond, including graduate school. Covered schools include all public and private schools receiving federal funds indirectly or directly. All students, employees, parents, guardians, student workers, and applicants at these schools are protected by Title IX. In this presentation, I will be referring to institutions covered by Title IX as schools for simplicity. More specifically, under Title IX, students have the right to not be discriminated against on the basis of their current, potential, or past pregnancy or related conditions. The U.S. Department of Education released new Title IX rules this April after an extensive notice and comment period. These new rules went into effect on August 1st of this year. The rules include new and stronger protections for pregnant and lactating students and improved access to reasonable modifications for pregnancy and lactation needs and to information about protections available under Title IX. We will now get more into specifically what your rights are under Title IX as a pregnant or parenting student. Students have the right to not be discriminated against on the basis of their current, potential, or past pregnancy or related conditions, which includes pregnancy, childbirth, termination of pregnancy, lactation, and recovery from these or related medical conditions. A school also cannot adopt or implement any policy, practice, or procedure concerning a student's current, potential, or past parental, family, or marital status that treats students differently on the basis of sex. As a quick overview, if you are protected under Title IX on the basis I just described, under certain circumstances, a school must provide certain information to you, take specific actions to promptly and effectively prevent sex discrimination and ensure equal access to the education program or activity, 
including making reasonable modifications to policies, practices, and procedures, allow voluntary access to a separate and comparable program of its program or activity, allow voluntary leaves of absence, and provide access to lactation space. Finally, the school must treat pregnancy or related conditions the same as other temporary medical conditions. Under certain circumstances, the school is not permitted to require supporting medical documentation or to require certification to participate in its education program or activities. Getting into more detail about these rights, you have the right to be informed. A school must ensure that when a student or a person who has a legal right to act on behalf of the student informs an employee of the student's pregnancy or related conditions, unless the employee reasonably believes the Title IX coordinator has already been notified, the employee must promptly give the student the Title IX coordinator's contact information and inform the student or person who has a legal right to act on behalf of the student that the Title IX coordinator can coordinate actions to prevent sex discrimination and ensure equal access to the school's education program or activity. Once the Title IX coordinator is notified of the student's pregnancy or related conditions, the school must provide to the student the school's notice of non-discrimination. The school must also inform them of the school's obligations to not discriminate, to provide Title IX coordinator information, provide the school's notice of non-discrimination, take specific actions to prevent discrimination, treat pregnancy or related conditions the same as other temporary medical conditions, and not require certain certification from a healthcare professional to participate in the school's classes, program, or activities, depending on the circumstances. More generally, schools are required to adopt, publish, and implement a non-discrimination policy regarding its education program or activity operations, including admissions, and grievance procedures, including the prompt and equitable resolution of complaints, and provide a notice of non-discrimination on its website, handbooks, catalog, announcement, bulletin, and application form, which contains a statement of non-discrimination, the Title IX coordinator's contact information, and info about where to find policy and grievance procedures and how to make inquiries, reports, and complaints under Title IX. Once the Title IX coordinator is notified of the student's pregnancy or related condition, a school is also required to take specific actions to promptly and effectively prevent sex discrimination and ensure equal access to the education program or activity. These actions include making reasonable modifications to policies, practices, and procedures, allowing the student to have voluntary access to a separate and comparable portion of the program or activity, allowing the student to take voluntary leaves of absence, and providing access to lactation space. The school must allow you to attend a separate and comparable portion of its education program or activity, but you cannot be forced to do so. These voluntary alternative programs must provide educational quality and academic offerings similar to those in the regular program. It is critical that the school provides clear information about what courses are available, how credits are transferred between the regular and alternative programs, and how a student can meet graduation requirements to help ensure that any separate programs offered to a pregnant student are both voluntary and comparable to the regular program. For example, if an alternative program provides only vocational track courses with no opportunity for advanced academic or college prep classes, it would not be considered comparable. However, the programs do not need to be identical. While an online portion of a recipient's program in some cases may not be considered substantially equal in quality to an in-person instruction, because, for example, it lacks certain extracurricular activities or opportunities for social interaction that a traditional program would have, such an option might offer a pregnant student who is confined to bed rest a comparable alternative that would keep them engaged in schools for, for a specific time frame and be preferable to remaining completely out of school. Likewise, an alternative program geared toward pregnant students may exceed the offerings of a recipient's general curriculum, for example, by including parenting classes to support the needs of the specific population. 
Even if a program meets the requirements of being comparable to the regular program, a student still must voluntarily choose to attend this alternative program and cannot be forced or coerced into attending an alternative program. A school is also generally required to treat pregnancy or related conditions in the same manner and under the same policies as any other temporary medical condition. This is based on individualized needs and what works for one student may not work for another. When necessary to prevent sex discrimination and ensure equal access to its education program and activities, a school is required to make a reasonable modification to its policies, practices, and procedures. Reasonable modifications and the process of determining them must adhere to the following student-centric parameters. Each reasonable modification must be based on the student's individualized needs. The school must consult with the student and the process must be collaborative. The student has discretion to accept or decline each reasonable modification offered. The student can decide whether to accept the reasonable modification offered by the school, request an alternative reasonable modification, or remain in their program under the status quo. If a student declines a particular offered reasonable modification that is based on the student's individualized needs and that would prevent sex discrimination and ensure equal access, the school is not required to determine whether there are other reasonable modifications based on that specific need, even if there are other reasonable modifications that could be offered. A modification that a recipient can demonstrate would fundamentally alter the nature of its education program or activity is not a reasonable modification. If a student accepts an offered modification, the school is required to implement it. Examples of reasonable modifications include, but are not limited to, access to online or homebound education, changes in schedule or course sequence, extensions of time for coursework and rescheduling of tests and examinations, allowing a student to sit or stand or to carry or keep water nearby, counseling, changes in physical space or supplies, such as access to a larger desk or footrest, and elevator access. Again, this determination is based on individualized needs and what works for one student may not work for another. You have the right to time and space for your lactation needs. Schools must ensure a student is able to access a lactation space to express breast milk or breastfeed, and that this space be clean, shielded from view, free from intrusion, and not a bathroom. The Department of Education has emphasized that schools must ensure access to a lactation space, rather than merely ensuring its availability. The department also noted that this requirement will not be costly for schools, because the Providing Urgent Maternal Protections for Nursing Mothers Act, the PUMP Act, already requires many schools to provide the same for lactating employees. Breaks during class to express breast milk or breastfeed are explicitly considered to be a reasonable modification to policies, practices, and procedures. You are also entitled to other reasonable modifications alongside breaks to ensure your access to the educational program. And these may include access to online or homebound instruction, changes in schedule or course sequence, extensions of time for coursework, and rescheduling of text, tests and examinations. Mitigating obstacles to access time and space for lactation needs, a school cannot require a student to provide supporting medical documentation to confirm lactation needs in connection with reasonable modifications or to gain access to a lactation space unless the documentation is necessary and reasonable for the school to determine the reasonable modifications to make or whether to take additional specific actions under the rules. Breaks during class to attend to health needs associated with pregnancy or related conditions, such as eating, drinking, or using the restroom, and intermittent absences to attend medical appointments are also considered to be reasonable modifications. The school must allow a student to take voluntary leaves of absence. Leave must, at minimum, cover the period of time deemed medically necessary by the licensed healthcare provider of the student. If a student no longer qualifies for leave under a different policy, if a student qualifies for longer leave under a different policy uh, maintained by the school, the school must permit the student to take leave under that policy instead. 
Again, you are also entitled to reasonable modifications alongside breaks and leave to ensure your access to the educational program, and these may include access to online or homebound education. Changes in schedule or course sequence, extensions of time for coursework, and rescheduling of tests and examinations. Further, when the student returns to the recipient's ed education program or activity, the student must be reinstated to the academic status and, as practicable, to the extracurricular status that the student held when the voluntary leave began. A school cannot require you to provide supporting medical documentation in connection with reasonable modifications unless it is reasonable and necessary to determine what actions it needs to take. Instances when documentation cannot be required include, but are limited to, when the student's need for a specific action is obvious. For example, a student who is pregnant needs a bigger uniform. The student has previously provided the recipient with sufficient documentation. The reasonable modification is allowing a student to carry or keep water nearby and drink, use a bigger desk, sit or stand, or take breaks to eat, drink, or use the restroom. The student has lactation needs and when the specific action is available to students for reasons other than pregnancy or related conditions without submitting supporting documentation. A school cannot require certification from a healthcare provider or any other person that the student is physically able to participate in class, the education program, or extracurricular activities unless the certified level of physical ability or health is necessary for participation in the class program or extracurricular activity. The recipient requires such certification of all students participating and the information obtained is not used as a basis for discrimination. If you are discriminated against, you are entitled to a process as detailed by Title IX regulations for the school to prevent and remedy that discrimination. Schools must designate and authorize at least one employee to coordinate their efforts to comply with and carry out their responsibilities under Title IX. This person is referred to as the Title IX coordinator. To exercise your rights, you can make a complaint with your school's Title IX coordinator, file a complaint with the Department of Education's Office for Civil Rights, and or file a civil lawsuit in court. Also, Retaliation for exercising your rights is prohibited by Title IX. The school must prohibit intimidation, threats, coercion, or discrimination by the school, peers, or employees for the purpose of interfering with the person's rights under Title IX or because a person has reported information or participated in an investigation or other proceeding under Title IX. A few practical tips. Communications should be in writing. If you communicated in person or over the phone with someone like the Title IX coordinator about what happened to you, follow up with an email summarizing the conversation. Maintain a written timeline explaining the discrimination you have experienced. Note when and where it happened, who was involved or may have observed the discrimination, and who you told and when. When you're requesting accommodations or reporting discrimination, you can bring fact sheets with you from, the OC from OCR explaining your rights and the school's obligations. When reporting a Title IX violation, keep moving up the chain if needed. If you start with telling a teacher in the K-12 through context, you could then talk to a guidance counselor, the vice principal, or the principal. In higher education, you could speak to department heads, deans, or other officials who handle requests for accommodations. You can also reach out to your Title IX coordinator. At the school district level, you can find your Title IX coordinator on OCR's Civil Rights Coordinators Data webpage, and at the college and university level, you can find your Title IX coordinator using the Department of Education's Campus Safety and Security Data Analysis Cutting Tool, both linked on the slide. To see some of these rights in action, we'll talk about a few case studies. Amy, a 10th grade student at a high school subject to Title IX, told the school's guidance counselor that she needed time and space to pump. The school allowed her to pump in a classroom that was simultaneously occupied by other students and did not allow her to make up work she missed in class from taking a break to pump. 
the school here has violated Title IX. First, a classroom with other students is not necessarily free from intrusion, shielded from view, and clean, as the law requires. If the school set up a space in a classroom with a divider and it was regularly cleaned, this may meet the requirements of Title IX. Second, Amy is entitled to equal access to her educational program and a reasonable modification that can accomplish this purpose is allowing her to make up work she missed while taking a reasonable break to pump. For our second case study, Kelly is an eighth grade student who is pregnant and attends a school that is subject to Title IX. She told the school that she is pregnant and requested to keep water near her and to stand at times during the school day. The school asked for medical documentation to support these requests. Without further discussion, the school then denied these requests and instead forced Kelly to attend school online rather than in person. The school has violated Title IX here as well. First, the school is required to consult the student about what reasonable modifications to offer, and they did not engage in this process with Kelly. Second, the school cannot require medical documentation for certain modifications, including keeping water nearby and standing. Third, the school cannot force Kelly to attend an alternative program. Kelly would need to choose this alternative program voluntarily, and it would need to be comparable to the regular program. For our third and final case study, Jess is a junior at a university subject to Title IX. They gave birth and took leave for 12 weeks, the period of time deemed necessary by their doctor. When they returned to school, their grade in organic chemistry had dropped because they had missed the final exam and been given a zero. Their professor did not allow them to make up the exam and they failed the class and had to retake it the following semester, setting back their graduation time. Jess kept a record of communications with the professor in writing and filed a Title IX complaint with the university's Title IX coordinator. After they filed the complaint in the following semester, the organic chemistry professor consistently failed to award Jess participation points despite their participation in class, decreasing Jess's grade. The school was required to allow Jess a voluntary leave of absence for the period of time deemed medically necessary by their licensed healthcare provider. After returning from leave, they should have been reinstated to the academic status they held when leave began. Jess also should have been given the reasonable modification of rescheduling the exam to provide them equal access to the education program. They were still protected by Title IX when they returned, as Title IX prohibits discrimination on the basis of past pregnancy and related conditions, including childbirth, related medical conditions, and recovery. The professor refusing to award just participation points despite their participation in class shortly after they filed a complaint about this professor may be discrimination against Jess for reporting the professor's behavior. This would likely be considered retaliation and violation of Title IX. To recap your rights under Title IX, as a pregnant or parenting student, depending on the circumstances, the school is required to take specific actions and make reasonable modifications to prevent discrimination on the basis of pregnancy or related conditions or parental status and must inform you about your rights and the processes available to you to enforce them. You can make a complaint with your school's Title IX coordinator, file a complaint with OCR, and or file a lawsuit in court to exercise your rights. You may have rights under other laws. Title II of the Americans with Disabilities Act protects all qualified individuals with a disability from discrimination by any public entity, including state or local public schools. The Rehabilitation Act is a national law that protects students in schools receiving federal financial assistance from being discriminated against on the basis of their disability, which includes pregnancy or lactation-related disabilities. It is important to note that pregnancy alone is not a disability, but pregnancy-related disabilities may qualify you for accommodations and protections under these laws. The Pennsylvania Human Relations Act is a Pennsylvania law that protects students from discrimination in a number of areas, including education and public accommodations. 
The regulations define the protected class of sex to include pregnancy status, childbirth status, breastfeeding status, sex assigned at birth, gender identity or expression, sexual orientation, and differences in sex development. The Pennsylvania Freedom to Breastfeed Act allows a mother in Pennsylvania to breastfeed her child in any location, public or private, where the mother and child are otherwise authorized to be present. Therefore, if a mother and child are both allowed to be in a space in an educational institution, then the mother is allowed to breastfeed in that location. The Pennsylvania Fair Educational Opportunities Act prohibits discrimination in post-secondary education and secondary education and trade schools. Many students are also working through their education, and you may have rights under employment laws for accommodations for pregnancy and lactation needs and pregnancy-related leave time. You may have additional protections under federal, state, and local laws or under school and school district policies. For example, the School District of Philadelphia's policy for pregnant and parenting students allows students to request adjustments based on general pregnancy needs or accommodations based on a pregnancy-related complication. During excused absence and leave, schools must take every reasonable effort to provide homework and makeup work to remain current with assignments and to avoid losing academic time. WLP's Legal Navigator program provides confidential legal advice and representation related to disclosure of pregnancy to the college or educational program, pregnancy accommodations, including modifications to class schedule, clinicals and exams, childbirth leave and modifications, including remote learning, lactation accommodations, pregnancy-based harassment or hostile educational environment, and retaliation. You can reach out to WLP's general intake line to seek assistance from our Legal Navigator program. These rights may not apply to every student, so please contact the Women's Law Project if you would like more information. You can visit WLP's website to learn more and to download Title IX Know Your Rights materials, or you can call for more individualized assistance. Thank you for watching and stay in touch.